Now that you've been introduced to phase changes, let's look at the energy involved in those changes. Here is a graph that I hope is familiar to you. It's a Coulomb's Law graph of opposite charges and their interactions with distance changes. Opposite charges attract. When they are very far away, the energy is close to zero. As the opposite charges get closer to one another, we know that the energy becomes more negative. So let's relate that to changes of state. Gas molecules or atoms are very far apart from one another, so their potential energy is large. Liquid molecules are closer to one another, so their potential energy is at a more medium level. And solid particles are very close together, so their potential energy is small and very negative relative to the potential energy of gases. This potential energy diagram shows the potential energy of different states of matter for the same substance. So far as we know, the majority of substances obey this particular diagram, where solids are at low potential energy, liquids are slightly higher, and gases are at very high potential energy. In thinking of the energy, if one wants to change from a liquid to a solid, you have to cool the substance. So energy is being removed, and we call that transition freezing. On the other hand, going from solid to liquid involves heating the material, so energy is going in, and we call that transition melting. When going from gas to liquid, you have to cool the gas to get the liquid, so energy is being removed, and we call that condensation. And when transitioning from liquid to gas, heat energy is needed, so we call that evaporation. Then there are some unusual circumstances where one can go directly from gas to solid. That involves removal of energy, and this transition is called deposition. Likewise, one can sometimes go from solid directly to gas, and this process is called sublimation. State changes have what are called enthalpies which are known as changes of heat at constant pressure. We'll get to that soon when we get to chapter nine. For now, know that increasing the distance between molecules requires energy because we're breaking intermolecular forces. So the energy required to go from liquid to gas phase at the same temperature is known as the enthalpy of vaporization. The energy required to go from solid to liquid phase without changing temperature is known as the enthalpy of fusion, and going from solid to gas phase is known as the enthalpy of sublimation. So that brings up the heating curve of a system. When a substance is heated, one of two things can happen. Either the temperature can be raised because the molecules move faster, or a phase change can occur because the molecules move further apart. This is what it would look like to heat up water. If we start with water in the solid phase, also known as ice, ice can be below zero degrees Celsius. In order to melt the ice, we first have to warm it up to zero degrees Celsius. At zero degrees Celsius, we get a phase change, and the mixture of ice and water will remain at zero degrees Celsius until all the ice has been converted to water. Only when we're at all water can we warm the system again from zero to 100 degrees Celsius. At this point, the mixture of water and steam, which would be gas phase water, stays at 100 degrees Celsius until all the liquid water is gone, and then finally all the steam, which is gas phase water, can be heated to higher temperatures. I think you know this, when water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, it's not like boiling it longer is going to raise the temperature. The temperature won't go up until all the water is gone.
Let's take a look at this animation, which does a nice job of explaining what's happening. What happens to the temperature of a block of ice when you put a Bunsen burner beneath it? You might think that the temperature goes up smoothly, but that's not what happens. The graph of temperature against time is called a heating curve. Let's look at the heating curve for water. You can see here, heat is added, and here is our temperature. We start at negative 40, we add heat, add that kinetic energy, temperature increases, increases. Up here you can see at that molecular level what those atoms would look like. Notice here what happens to our temperature. It does not increase, but we are still adding heat energy. Where's that energy going if it's not increasing the temperature? It's going to break those bonds from a solid, break them, so then they can get into a liquid. Then we continue to add heat. Notice liquid, increase in temperature. Here's our nice visual of our liquid. Then once again we get to 100 degrees C. So what happens? That energy being added is once again going into breaking those bonds those liquid, the bonds to, that are between those, those uh, water molecules that have it as liquid. So then it goes into the gas space. Continue to add heat. And notice that heat energy that's added is going back into increasing the temperature. So this brings up the idea of phase diagrams. Phase diagrams show the effect of temperature and pressure upon the state of a substance. Here we have temperature at the x-axis and pressure on the y-axis. In general, as you might imagine, solid is where the temperature is low, liquid starts when the temperature is higher, and gas when the temperature is higher still and the pressure is lower. Anywhere on the lines of this diagram, two phases are in equilibrium. Just like we saw with the heating curve where you had both solid and liquid available or liquid and gas available. So let's start with the lower energy transition where solid and liquid are in equilibrium and melting if we put energy in or freezing if we take energy out, occur. The melting and the freezing points are temperatures at which the solid and liquid states are in dynamic equilibrium. They're both present, as you saw in the animation. The heat of fusion, that's the amount of heat required to melt a substance at its melting point. And the stronger the intermolecular forces, the higher the melting point. Where are solid and liquid at equilibrium? on this blue line in the diagram. This is where melting and freezing will simultaneously be occurring in a dynamic equilibrium. To relate this to a compound, this is a mock-up of the phase diagram for carbon tetrachloride, and if I place a point on that blue line, we know that carbon tetrachloride melts at minus 23 degrees Celsius when the pressure is one atmosphere. Here are some selected enthalpies of fusion for various molecules. If we start with neon the gas, you notice that its enthalpy of fusion is very low, does not take much energy to go from solid to liquid phase, and that melting point is 24 degrees Kelvin. You notice as we increase in the intermolecular forces up to water, the enthalpy of fusion increases, and the melting point also increases. Changes in pressure can affect the melting or the freezing point. Most substances have a more dense solid and a less dense liquid. So if one increases the pressure on the liquid, it will turn to a solid. So typically this line for melting and freezing equilibrium is canted to the right. Water is a unique substance. Water actually has a less dense solid phase due to this hexagonal crystal structure and a more dense liquid. 
So you notice that water's melting and freezing line is canted to the left. So if one increases the pressure on ice, it becomes liquid. So this is helpful in the way that it allows people to ice skate and hockey to occur, but not helpful if you happen to be driving a car. Nothing like a nice bit of liquid water on top of the ice for lubrication so your car can slip and slide.